Yeah, welcome everyone for our race COE seminar in November. Today we have accelerating machine learning with graph core intelligence processing units. So a very interesting material today. And uh, this seminar is co-organized with the National Competence Center for HPC and AI in Iceland. So basically the agenda of today is um, firstly um, to introduce a little bit the speakers. Um, we have here representatives from the graph core company, which is quite interesting. That will also enlighten us later what this IPUs are all about. And I will provide, before we start with this, a little bit of context, what is the COE race? Why is this is of relevance in COE race and how it reflects maybe machine learning, deep learning and AI at large. So you see also in the second part, then we have two experts, Pavel Gettner and Alexander Titterton from both GraphCore um, and being specialists in the field, particularly in the hardware side and you know can really give us details on this intelligence processing units, which is a complete new way of looking at hardware. When you think about our earlier seminars where we thought about you know, modular supercomputing, there are quantum computers coming up, there are accelerators already, and now we have something like a graph-oriented intelligence processing unit. So you see the, the landscape gets more heterogeneous, um, including, of course, the MI100 cards that were coming up uh, from you know, non-NVIDIA, so to speak. So also the accelerator world will be very much uh, more heterogeneous. We will be having a little bit like Q&A session at the end, but of course also Pavel and Alexander are probably accessible via emails to have then also more discussions. I should also note that this is recorded here, just that you know. Um, then a short introduction to the speakers. We have Professor Pavel Gebner, who is an associate professor at the Warsaw University of Technology uh, in Poland. And then um, we have another expert, um, Dr. Alexander Titterton, who is from basically uh, get a PhD in particle physics and does also with graph core. They will both present um, their slides here and there in the seminar. And uh, basically shortly for myself, um, I'm actually a professor of high performance computing in parallel and scalable machine learning here at the University of Iceland, but also 16 years or 17 years by now, I think at the Uli Supercomputing Center in Germany, a research group leader. I should also say in the context of policy, I'm also the EuroHPC Joint Undertaking Governing Board member for Iceland. So I have quite a good view of what's happening until 2027 in HPC in Europe. And if you want to know more, there's my website. Also a short hint that this seminar is co-organized by the so-called National Competence Center, EHPC, Icelandic HPC, uh, which is funded under the umbrella of the EuroCC project that many of you probably know and which have you now basically NCCs in all different countries around 33 or 34 around Europe. A particular speciality of our National Competence Center is that we create so-called simulation and data labs, which we actually collaboratively create with the Uli Supercomputing Center that has done this in 17 years. We are quite new in this, so we're doing this since a year now, but we already have, let's say, 10 different simulation and data labs created in all different domain-specific sciences. And uh, this is, um, let's say, an ongoing activity, which is really in EuroCC embraced. Apart from this, um, also looking at COE race, what's the context? We're thinking here really towards exascale performance. That means in 2024, 2023, we probably will see that Jülich um, may get one. So as you know, there will be a call from the EuroHPC joint undertaking and uh, Germany is going in. Um, as you know, will probably apply for one of these exascale systems. That doesn't say that it will get it. So it's of course a competitive call, but there's some likelihood. And the way how this is basically um, operating and planned is in a very modular design. So we're talking about in Jülich, uh, this modular supercomputing, and this reflects a little bit what we talk about today, because we see here booster models with having lots of, let's say, GPUs to really scale up we have still cluster modules with high single thread performance and CPUs, but we see also modern modules like you know quantum modules. Some of you will know that basically Ulich is quite strong also in quantum computing. We from the University of Iceland contribute there a lot with publications on a D-wave quantum annealer, for instance, for concrete machine learning problems. And the idea is not that you basically do general processing on all of these. Um, it's rather that you use them, as we know, a little bit from the accelerators for specific purposes. So you would say for optimization, machine learning, 
quantum computing, for instance, um, you know, quantum alleling could be quite nice for solving complex optimization problems, but then you're back for general processing on the cluster or booster modules. Now, in a similar way, we could now see actually a module on graphs, right? So graph CPU that we will actually hear more about today. That's why it fits nicely into this architecture. And why is this the future? I think it's very eminent that we in Europe at least cannot afford this hyperscaler um, idea of having always the same systems like Summit or Fugaku. Um, here you see also the Lumi system in Finland, which is actually also a modular supercomputer with Lumi G for the GPU position, Lumi C for CPU position, and so forth. They also think about a Lumi Q, of course, a quantum idea, which is essentially the same model. It's just called partition here, while the others are a bit well, a module. So this is something what you also can see in a YouTube video. So I stop here um, to talk too much about that and would like to just come back a little bit more to race. So let me let's switch the slides here. And if you have questions, please feel free to note them in the chat. We will address them later on when we have the discussion session. So let us just quickly review um, for those who are new to race here in our YouTube channel, um, what is the relevance um, really for race in this graph core intelligence processing unit? So why can we use it? What is race all about? Just a short introduction to that. Of course, there's much more information on our website. So if you want to know more about CEO race, please go ahead and, you know, basically look there. It's use cases, research, our approaches are all basically nicely described there. But the general overview maybe is, is best explained if you have this graphic, which we consider as a full loop. You have simulations, so still known um, physical laws based on, you know, numerical methods maybe that do lots of data generation. And this is, could be an input then to interesting simulation sciences where you use um, then AI technologies intertwined with them. So you kind of have surrogate models. Um, you have different, let's say, um, ideas of different models that could help in understanding maybe features coming out of the data. Think about latent spaces of outer encoders and so forth. So in a way, it's a very general slide, but you see also the focus is here definitively on the 10 to the 18. So which means then essentially um, exascale. This is, of course, a bold statement, and that's why it's a research project. So here and there, we are not maybe that far to exascale, only here and there. Some of the use cases are really far in this regard. We have two kinds of um, use cases here. We have computer-driven use cases, you see, from all different areas of sciences here, a little bit focusing on engineering use cases. And then we have a second part of use cases, which is more the data-driven use cases, which are then really starting from the data side, and is less based on, let's say, physical laws and numerical methods. All of them contribute for us um, in a way to basically understand how we can use AI at exascale together with the simulation sciences. You see here, essentially, the outcome of all of these different nine use cases is always data, which is the symbol, and then also some form of an AI model. And in some cases, we have even several models for one use case. And this gives you, let's say, the idea of the project Essentially, we have their uh, computer use cases that kind of co-design so-called framework that we de develop and to contribute to the understanding. In work package three and work package four, these are computer and data-driven use cases. And this seminar is organized by work package two, which is kind of orthogonal to them to, let's say, support and contribute and do what we can to really uh, encourage the uptake of machine learning, which is a little bit a new topic here and therefore the simulation sciences at large um, from the past. So here, thinking about scaling machine learning models, really with Horobot, these days we also experiment with DeepSpeed, a new model for actually scaling up. Then we have um, different types of AI models. Uh, while image recognition is largely understood, a lot of used in CNNs, convolutional networks, there's also time series, what you can use in terms of deep learning, where we help with seminars like this. Here and there, we suffer from not having enough data. So there are data augmentation approaches that we applied, and then also um, having benchmarking here and there. You now, what is really the technology of choice moving towards exascale performance? So how we can see that essentially some of these tools and technologies, you know, there are many of them out there from TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, and so on. So what are these um, and how they're scaling and how it reflects also the accuracy? Right, so efficiency is not always the best when the accuracy drops for an AI researcher. 
So this is something what we also, of course, take into account. And then what the future for exascale will be, where we are quite certain is really this, this kind of hyperparameter tuning, the neural architecture search methods. This becomes more or less a standard in the future, while now researchers are digging into different mechanisms to really pick here and there the parameters, or they do a, let's say, full grid search and burn a lot of computing power. More systematic approaches might be an exascale automatically available when you do AI modeling, automatically having a system where you do hyperparameter tuning directly, where you say, for instance, ray tune or optune, and actually looking on these as well. And that's how basically Work Package 2 contributes. And what the project goal at large is essentially is to create a so-called unique AI framework, which different, let's say, set of components that are well understood and where we can say that is what we certify to be ready for exascale or at least moving towards exascale. And here you can imagine the hardware infrastructure is quite important. Hence, today, this is a very good part. With GraphCore, you have a different type of architecture that we had previously based on, let's say, systems we have in the project, like the Juvel system, for instance, in Jülich, but also the deep um, systems or the Barcelona Mare Nostrum system. Then the software infrastructure goes without saying, if you want to do large-scale AI, you have not only the solvers and the numerical methods, and these are very well understood and can scale up. We have to understand better how the AI technologies which are around can really leverage HPC, can really scale up, because many of those are rather, let's say, designed for more workstations, you know, having one GPU under the desk somewhere instead of having, let's say, hundreds of GPUs in parallel used. And essentially, this in a loop contributes via the use cases co-designing so to speak, this unique AI framework, which is well embedded essentially in open source technologies, where also, you know, we basically pushing this in the UHPC and national competence centers in Europe, and of course, also praise. So the me methods how we did this was largely um, starting with so-called fact sheets. So there are fact sheets available very soon from all of these different use cases so that you get an understanding what they are doing. And then this was an input basically for a so-called interaction room um, approach, which is actually proper software engineering approaches driven by experts like Professor Matthias Bog and Professor Helmut Neukirchen here at the University of Iceland. And there we basically carved out the different requirements. And here's some example of fact sheets that we published um, in the area basically of remote sensing. It's one particular use case in COE race where you see here the ideas of how you use um, AI models with quantum computers, with D-Wave, for instance, a quantum annealer, or you basically use improved, let's say, more modern concepts like containers, basically like singularity, for instance, on these HPC machines with distributed training and so forth in another paper. So essentially that was the methodology um, that let's say is a 10,000 feet perspective maybe, but also diving in this interaction room that we held regular. Um, we don't talk about this very much here today. That's why I also want to give you essentially a hint to our YouTube channel if you don't know about it yet. There we have all our race seminars basically recorded and will be available as soon as possible if they're not there yet uh, from all the previous months. Basically we have one seminar per month and should be appearing there shortly. So what we came up with um, is essentially a big matrix with different use cases using different models, as you can imagine. And the interesting connection now to the seminar today, why it's relevant is essentially best explained when we maybe pick just one model out of the many we have in this U Erase project. You see this here a little bit here with the metrics and the different models on the top. Um, and basically, when you look just as an example, maybe from convolutional neural networks, how that really operates if you use a tool like TensorFlow, inherently it's computational graphs. You see that here a little bit when you have the input picture and it goes into some reshaping of the pictures and they have lots of matrix multiplications, adding the bias in the so-called rectified linear unit layer, activation function, and then you go layer by layer and actually have this SGD training, which then is updating the weights. Right? That is where really the optimization, that's where the learning and machine learning really comes from. And then, of course, this is done iteratively in order to um, learn over time from the data at hand. But the key message to take away is we transform a Python script um, that we all know with, you know, import TensorFlow, et cetera, and then write this, or you even use maybe Keras and sequential modeling. But in the end, this Python script will be at some point in time transformed to a so-called execution graph or computation graph, however you call it. 
uh, for performing readily than the deep learning, as you see here nicely in this illustration from TensorFlow. And there the question reveals is, when there is a native structure of this execution already as a graph, what about the processing units for it? And of course, here's now the idea, if you have a native processing of a graph that is particularly supported by hardware, can we not speed up this execution of the graph by orders of magnitudes? And I think this is something what we will hear more about later from the graph core experts. So I don't, we'll talk here much more about this, but you can imagine this has been off not only for CNNs, you see here also we work with graph neural networks in the projects, which of course are also then applicable to this. And if you want also the typical shallow neural networks can benefit from this because inherently they're sharing very different, uh, very similar concepts as well. And auto encoders and so forth. This was just an example, make the concrete case of the CNN. So we talk about again, um, how we can improve perhaps with the hardware in these kind of technologies, how we can improve and speed up TensorFlow, PyTorch, how we can use this together with Horovod, maybe scaling up. Horovod is known for using different GPUs in parallel. So we have to understand how we can use different graph processing or intelligence processing units in parallel. But this is something later maybe for the discussion. You see here a little bit our um, race unique AI framework as a blueprint. So to speak of the different, let's say added values it gives. And uh, it has essentially a certain collection of uh, Jupyter kernels, which really are proven to work well on HPC systems. We have a light framework from Python that abstracts a little bit from the underlying, let's say um, libraries very soon. We're working on this right now. And then of course, um, all the kind of frameworks we have to test, we actually do benchmarking a lot to understand which of those scaling and which accuracy provide when they scale. And, and these elements, and of course, then also thinking about portability, the singularity, this is an important part, and what happens with pre-staged uh, pre data sets, so really large quantities of data, so when we think about exascale performance. But in a way, there's much more information on the website. There will be a November news article just around this unique AI framework, so stay tuned to look basically in December about our November news item coming up. And this is all I wanted to leave on the table here for you as an introduction, admittedly a short introduction, but we also want to focus today really on graph core and basically the intelligence processing units. So with this, I would look a little bit on basically Pavel, who will run the show a little bit together with his team at graph core and welcome again, Pavel and Alexander. Uh, feel free to share if you want your slides, we are ready. Yes, we, we are. Thanks very much, Maurice, and uh, thanks very much for the introduction uh, you, uh, you provide for us and also some uh, short uh, overview of uh, uh, race project. In fact, uh, our idea is pretty much isomorphic what you were presenting, and I think we are eager to look uh, how we can work together. Uh, because our, our vision for the exascale computing and how we can uh, couple the uh, AI to HPC is pretty much the same what you described. So uh, what will, I'm going to do in the few seconds, I'm not sure if you can see my slide. Yes, it works. Um, not not yet. It's a little bit in presenters presenters mode. So okay. we see the next slide on the right. Okay. okay, so let me try to disable my monitor and then should be much easier. Uh, I still, I will switch to. Okay. Yeah. Better. Uh, in the moment, I don't see slides. It may take a, a minute or a second. No, I don't see anything right now. So second again. Give me the second. What? Maybe I will stop sharing and start sharing again. Uh huh. There's something happening. Yeah. At least we see a chat now. Ah, yeah, the slides are coming up. They're still not in full. Yeah, now it's, I think now it's working. 
Go ahead, Pavel. Thank you okay. very much. Thanks very much. So what uh, we are going to do in the uh, 90 minutes or so, uh, we are going to give you the very introductional uh, information about the graph call, what we are doing, where we are uh, going with our products, uh, what is the uh, potential area of collaboration and all uh, 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 our collaboration with the academia team. So what is the graph call? Just to give you the, some uh, uh, basic understanding, we are the British company with the headquarters in Bristol. We have the uh, three R&D site uh, in the Great Britain mainly in Bristol and Cambridge, but also some people are working from London. All the system engineering is uh, in terms of our system level is done in Oslo, but we uh, currently opened the, also the office, uh, uh, R&D office in Poland, in Gdańsk, uh, where we are mainly working on the HPC to AI program, uh, what we are calling, so basically this, uh, what the race is looking for, so how we can uh, collaborate with the typical HPC the, uh, the simulation type of the problems to be converted or to be coupled with the uh, AI models. This is exactly what you presented for race. So I think we are matching perfectly what you would like to achieve. And as I said, we would like to, to uh, work a little bit closely and more even deeply, uh, uh, which this presentation is not going to show, but we need to, to sign the NDA. And then, of course, we can go uh, to all the details uh, uh, we can discuss uh, together. So basically what uh, uh, GraphCore does, we are um, doing the trip uh, components. So first of all, we're doing the uh, silicon. Our uh, silicon is what we are calling the IPO. So intelligent processor unit. This is grand up products completely designed for the AI type of workloads. I will go to the details very soon. Second component is our software. So we are calling the popular software stack and all the development tool. Uh, basically, the, this the SDK is uh, completely developed to support our hardware. Uh, if you like, uh, and I like this uh, analogy or the sentence uh, uh, Steve Jobs said, okay, if you are really serious about your hardware, start with your software first. So this is what we uh, built uh, together. And the third uh, component, last but not least, we are building the platform when, uh, when you can uh, take all these uh, benefits of hardware and software and see just uh, as the uh, uh, platform uh, we are calling IPM 2000 server or, or uh, in IPU pod. I will go to the details what it is and how this disaggregated approach uh, works uh, for the AI uh, type of workloads. So, but let's start with uh, the uh, heart of our uh, uh, architecture. Our IPU processor. Of course, uh, before we started, you need to understand a little bit background of the company. Company has there some historical background, uh, which is connected to building the accelerator, mainly mainly for the high performance technical computing. A lot of architects and engineers from the software and hardware team were working on the British company called ClearSpeed. Some of you who are in this industry for the long time. It is uh, probably a very known name, and it was the one of the first uh, HPC accelerator before the uh, NVIDIA was thinking to, to, to join the, the party of the HPC. Uh, but we were talking to the AI uh, uh, scientists and the users, and they said, okay, uh, the biggest problem we have, in fact, are the limitation of what the architecture can bring in terms of the CPU and the GPU. Of course, if you're just thinking about the CPU, my, uh, basically they are scalar type of the uh, computer, uh, computing uh, devices uh, developed mainly for the application and to web type of the purposes. Uh, and uh, when you are talking about the GPU, they, they were basically the, um, developed as the graphic, the HPC and the AI came later, but the, by principles, they were not designed completely for the AI type of workloads, which are a little bit different uh, for, from what we have in the graphics or the um, scholar type of the web application. You know, and so, in fact, you know, it's very hard to, to say that the uh, CPU or the GPU are, you know, the Scala processor or the some uh, homogeneous type of the architecture. If we look on the CPU vectorization units today, of course, you know, we use the very intensively Symbias, you know, uh, uh, um, AVX512 is the best example of how the CPU can be effective. But of course, uh, in the same time, we are just facing the energy program, which we all uh, uh, worry about it. 
So we came with a completely new idea. So we built something completely starting uh, from the scratch, which we are calling the IPU, Artificial Intelligent uh, Processor Unit. And it's the uh, products which is uh, dedicated to the AI uh, type of workload. Uh, but it is based on the two fundamental problems we were already observing. One of them is the massive parallelism. And the second, uh, the needs for the very uh, fast uh, uh, memory access. If we, uh, uh, if we look on the parallelism aspect, we see that on the CPU, we have this uh, uh, um, uh, scalar type of the processor with the Samsung instruction. Uh, the same with the graphics. We are talking about the hundreds uh, of the uh, parallel uh, threads which can be uh, executed simultaneously. But uh, when the IPU uh, is considered, we are talking about the massive parallelism. It's not the CMD architecture any longer. It's based on the uh, on the NIMD um, architecture, if you like, uh, using the, um, uh, the taxonomy. Uh, and uh, is the um, multiple instruction, multiple data. And it is uh, highly uh, dedicated for the massive parallelism, effectively executed machine learning threads with the very small uh, kernels and operating on the sparsity of the data with some of the uh, natural limitation we have from the uh, uh, AI, uh, as we are not supporting 64-bit, for example, uh, because 64-bit uh, uh, calculation is not something AI is looking for. So um, this is one of the difference, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, data type we're operating it. The second aspect, which is also very important, is the memory access. Usually, most of the CPU are using the off-of-the-chip memory, uh, and uh, some of the most sophisticated memory subsystem you can find on the GPU are, of course, the HBM2, but they are on the level of magnitudes uh, so, um, uh, slower what we can achieve with our approach. So basically our idea was to put the model and the, uh, and the data, tiny couple uh, working together on the very largely distributed SRAM. So we have the uh, all our memory and the um, uh, uh, execution uh, um, processor unit coupled together, working uh, very closely, minimizing the time needed for the data exchange. The second very important element before we go a little bit deeply to the chip itself is that here we are, you know, uh, implement first time in the hardware as, uh, as long as I am aware, uh, BSP, so bulk synchronization parallel model. Uh, and uh, we are uh, trying to uh, use this uh, uh, valiant concept uh, created uh, for the HPC uh, to, uh, to deterministically execute it, uh, all our uh, code for the machine learning uh, type of the application. So if you look on the chip itself, uh, uh, it, it, we are calling this GC200 uh, intelligent processor unit. When we introduced it, it was the world's most complex processor, uh, almost 60 billion transistor. Uh, developed uh, and produced in the TCMC seven nanometers uh, process technology. From the performance standpoint, it uh, contains and provides something like a 250 teraflops AI float. Uh, uh, and we have uh, something like almost one gig uh, in memory uh, on the chip. Uh, as I said, a redistributed, very uh, 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 tiny couple to with our execution engine. So in the essence, we are providing almost 1,500 independent processor scores, able to execute uh, almost 9,000 uh, separate parallel threads. And of course, it's the second generation of our uh, chip. It's not the something we, uh, we first uh, appeared on the market. Our first generation of the chip was the Mark I, and uh, we provided something like eight times uh, 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 speed up we're comparing to the system performance versus first generation. And as you can imagine, we are working on the next generation of our products, which are going to bring the, uh, the same uh, kind of the improvements as you can imagine versus the uh, Mark II, which we are completely uh, shipping right now and uh, uh, are fully in the production. So let's look on this uh, uh, floor plan when we can uh, look a little bit closer to our GC200 IPO processor. As you can see on this floor plan, it is the lot of small uh, square and the triangles. 
and they are the, representing what we are just calling the IPU cores. This is the smallest portion. This is, uh, um, let me say, orange or uh, uh, red type of uh, uh, squares. This is the, the cores. And uh, uh, just close to them, you see the, 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 uh, the rectangles, which are the memory, uh, uh, which are coupled to the, uh, to the, um, uh, uh, to the execution engine, to the uh, IPU cores. So as I said, we have the 1472 independent IPU tiles. Each of them is with their own uh, processor memory. Uh, we, we have in the total uh, 900 megabytes in processor uh, memory per IPU. So uh, the uh, uh, aggregated uh, memory bandwidth, if you execute them in the, uh, 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 in the MIDI, uh, uh, massive parallel execution mode is the something like a 47.5 terabytes per second memory bandwidth. In the same time, we provide to the, uh, according to the BSP model uh, during the exchange uh, uh, phase, we need to provide very effective uh, exchange mechanism. This is what we are calling all to all uh, communication uh, uh, mechanism where we are just able to use the eight terabytes per second all to all IPU exchange. So each core is connected to each other with very efficient, uh, mm, mm, uh, with very efficient link. And uh, during the execution phase, we can uh, uh, exchange the data from the any uh, of the core to the another in the very affecting uh, way fashion. And in addition to, of course, uh, on cheap uh, communication, we provide also uh, our uh, chip to chip uh, communication as well, building blocks to building blocks or server to server communication, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. This is what we are calling the IP uh, links, so where you can transfer something like a, uh, 64 gigabytes per second on the chip to chip bandwidth. And uh, of course, so we can uh, uh, scale the system up to unlimited uh, 10,000 uh, IPU scale with uh, using our IPU links and uh, IPU over fabric uh, technology, which is going to be discussed on the couple of uh, few slides from now. So this is the basic uh, block of our, uh, of our hardware. So um, GC200 IPU processor unit. Uh, but uh, of course, in uh, conjunction with our software, we are building something what we are calling IPU uh, M2000 Intelligent Compute Blade. If you look on this blade, the, uh, as I'm presenting on the slide, it contains, of course, uh, aggregated performance of the single chip and also memory. So you have the something like uh, one petaflop IPU compute power. Uh, basically, what we see on this slide, we have uh, here the four uh, chips of so four uh, uh, IPU GC200 uh, IPU processor uh, connected together with our IPU fabric. And uh, we have the something like uh, what we are calling GCPU gateway, which is basically the um, uh, orchestrator and administrator of, of this uh, platform. So this uh, um, uh, 1U uh, intelligent compute blade is the some kind of the appliance which providing you the one petaflop compute power uh, connected uh, to uh, can be uh, tacked together to aggregate uh, your uh, offload type of a performance. So our uh, scalability story is pretty simple. It's uh, basically four chip uh, needed to build the one IPO M2000 machine. And as you can see on the left hand side of the side, uh, and this is the basic building blocks to something what we are calling the pot. IPU pot is combination of the two elements. So host server, where we are just uh, putting our popular uh, software and we are compiling the graph, which is going to be executed on the uh, IPM 2000 uh, uh, constellation of the machines. And uh, these this two elements, so host server plus our IPM 2000 machines, we are calling the pod. Pod four, it contains, of course, just single machine connected to the host. Uh, pod 16 is the uh, one host and uh, four IPU M2000, so five uh, uh, U kind of the solution. And is there just for the exploration, just to get the first uh, feeling how it, it operates, uh, just to build the, some uh, basic uh, uh, POC and uh, how the technology is performing. 
And then uh, when you are just adding additional uh, uh, multiplying this by four, so you are uh, getting uh, something like a pot 64. A pot 64 contains 16 of the IPOM to the thousand. And of course, because it's the very completely disaggregated architecture, it also uh, can be extended uh, for the host server when you would like to have the, some uh, capability type of the computing, some more user, more different workload, uh, when you are just uh, need to, to share this uh, platform between the uh, a scientific group, uh, so it can be completely scaling in the way how you are just uh, scaling your uh, project. So you can add additional uh, host server, but in the same time you can aggregate the performance of the IPU. So the next step is of course the IPU 128. When you have something like a 32 petaflops uh, AI computing, and you have the 32 of this IPOM 2000 machine. And uh, today we are supporting uh, IPU pot 128 and uh, of course the IPU 256, which is basically 64 of our IPU and 2000, uh, working as one logical uh, domain when you can uh, scale this architecture according to your needs. And of course you can uh, assign to the user uh, according to, to uh, customer needs. Uh, but we are not limited in fact uh, by architecture. Architecture is uh, based on the fact that we can go to the 64,000 of the IPO and we are just reaching the exascale computing where we can get the six x exaflop uh, uh, machine. Of course, it, it will require some kind of the uh, improvement of our software and uh, scaling capabilities. Uh, today, uh, our current SDK, which is, you know, released every three months, is supporting bigger machine. Today, the biggest machine we can support is the IPU pot uh, 256. And uh, so we are just on the 64 petaflops uh, ratio. So is the uh, big area at the front of us, but of course, uh, as you already mentioned on your slide, we are also targeting that this type of the computing is going to be essential for the exascape uh, capability. So we'll see in the two years or three years from now. So this is basically our scalability story in terms of the um, in terms of uh, uh, how we are building uh, the machines. So the, the basic component, as I said, is the IPU pod 16. Uh, the, we are calling direct attach. We don't have the, any switch. It's the, uh, some basic uh, uh, machine when you can get the first feeling how the architecture works. And as you can see on the top, uh, we, uh, we have the one your typical x86 server when our popular is uh, installed and when we are just uh, uh, calculating the graph, which is going to be uh, executed on our IP uh, and 2000 machine. And we have the four of those machines connected to, together with the, uh, with the uh, special dedicated links. We are using the uh, QSFP uh, uh, network cable and of course 100 uh, gigs Rocky uh, solution to communicate with the server. Each of the, uh, the IPM 2000 is connected to one of the ports on the server. We have the, the red lines are representing our synchronization links. And you have the something like uh, uh, IPO links, uh, which are on the uh, 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 right-hand side, where, I, uh, where they are connecting all the IPUs together to one logical domain. So basically from the server perspective or user perspective, you have the 16 IPU available for you and you can assign them uh, to, to your job uh, as, uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, uh, as the problem is uh, defined. And of course, this is the basic architecture, something uh, more uh, closer to the production is the pod 64. As you can see, it is uh, basically the same concept where we have the two uh, networking domain. One domain is the uh, domain which is responsible for the communication with the host server or servers. The second one is on the right, uh, uh, right hand side is connecting all them uh, to one logical glue and of course you can uh, build and uh, configure the system in the way uh, as you wish so you know we have the 64 ipus uh, so 16 of the uh, 
uh, IPO M2000, uh, basically 16 petaflops at the floating point 16. Uh, and uh, this is the fully disaggregated solution where your server can be just only single one, or if you need to you uh, the couple of the groups or multi tenant uh, you can add the more server, or if your model requires uh, some uh, uh, version which needs to be compiled separately, you can add additional server on the top. And uh, everything is in the 2D Torus uh, topology. And so maximizing the band bandwidth across the uh, IPU, as you can see on the right hand side. And of course, uh, we can uh, use this kind of the building block of approach of the pod 64 to combine them to the bigger installation. As I said, you know, 128 is basically a combination of two of such racks. When we have the inside the IPU gateway link switch fabric, which is responsible to communicate uh, between the two racks. In fact, we are adding the additional uh, level or the torus uh, the type of uh, dimension. So we have the uh, communication, not just only uh, vertically, but we have also the uh, horizontally, where all the servers can uh, communicate each other and uh, be perceived as the one single logical domain. This is basically uh, our approach. And uh, this is uh, what the one, uh, uh, 28, uh, pot uh, 256 is pretty much the same as you can see, uh, but instead of the two, we have the four of them, uh, all of them are con uh, connected together. Uh, so in the biggest today's supported configuration, we provide the 64 petaflops and the 206 IPUs connected together, working in one logical instance, solving your most uh, sophisticated problem you can imagine. How our scaling is looks like this is a, uh, this is very impressive because this uh, uh, disaggregated approach shows that, that this is the right way how we can scale our uh, system from the pot 16 up to pot uh, 56. As you can see, we are able to achieve the scaling around the uh, 90 uh, percent going from the pot uh, 16 uh, to the pot uh, 256 uh, versus. Uh, generation. We are using the ResNet, uh, T, uh, ResNet 15 uh, to, to measure this uh, the, uh, the scaling. So this, I think the scaling story and the disaggregation approach is absolutely fantastically resonated uh, with this disaggregated uh, solution. And uh, for another example of how the scaling looks like uh, from the very large perspective, we also are around the uh, ninety percent of uh, scaling efficiency in going from the pot sixteen to, to the pot uh, one twenty eight and two hundred fifty six. Uh, uh, we observe pretty much the same scaling as I speak. So, um, the, as I said, this is the beginning of a uh, big journey for the exascape computing, including the compute data communication. Uh, type of uh, the, the story. And uh, of course, so we are targeting uh, the big installation in the future when you can just imagine that the 512 of such racks uh, can give you the 65,000 of the IPO for the most uh, important and uh, biggest uh, models uh, you can run today uh, with the very easy deployment standard data center uh, capabilities, very low light, latency fabric, and of course, uh, very uh, securing uh, uh, multi -tenant, uh, tenant uh, type of uh, uh, configuration. Uh, let's start a little bit uh, uh, where we see the pretty much the same area of collab, uh, the same area of interest, and uh, when we potentially is the area of collaboration between the uh, race consortium uh, and uh, uh, community uh, we have today on the call and the graph call. Uh, as I said, you know, in addition to the typical machine learning workloads, we realize that more and more problems cannot be solved the same like uh, you described by the typical HPC simulation, uh, uh, but. Uh, 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 the way how we would like to solve uh, these uh, problems are the combination of the uh, machine learning and HPC. 
And of course, uh, the, the, my, my slide is uh, pretty much what you already described, that we are see some data generated uh, uh, simulation today. The, uh, I like your uh, uh, spiral uh, uh, version of, uh, uh, of the explanation. Probably I will ask you to, uh, to borrow this and, uh, uh, in my next presentation. Uh, but uh, we are looking that the typical simulation like CFD can generate a lot of data which can be used for the building the model and uh, trade the model in the machine learning type of the approach. Then, of course, the model is already trained and we are going to the uh, replacing the typical sol solver, which was based on the Lagrange, Laplace, whatever uh, type of the uh, solution. We are going to put it uh, the solver based on the AI. And uh, when we are going to the inference, our solver is going to uh, bring you the answer and the uh, resolution much quicker than it uh, would be the generated in the typical scenario. Uh, so the, then this uh, graph on uh, on the bottom of the of the slide explain how we would like to replace typical simulation time by a combination of the accelerated part when the data we need to take the data from the classical simulation reformat then build the model uh, uh, apply the model with the inference and uh, get the uh, data export uh, to our classical simulation and we are able to achieve our result much faster than a it was uh, done in the classical way. Uh, we already uh, all, uh, on this call probably observed the same trend in every center and uh, the uh, race consortium is the best example that the uh, scientific community is looking for this type of the approach very heavily. Uh, you, you already described how many models you are trying uh, to, to deploy and uh, what area or, and the uh, uh, research that people are looking at this. Uh, uh, um, our area where we are just observing when this uh, approach can be uh, applicable, it, uh, it contains the high energy physics, computational fluid dynamics, partial differential equation, protein folding, everything what you have the Monte Carlo simulation is probably the uh, great example for uh, an India approach. And uh, uh, weather forecast uh, simulation or oil and dust uh, uh, exploration and the type of the code is the good candidate to this uh, approach. And I think uh, this uh, this list pretty much uh, uh, match what you present uh, in your table uh, where the race consortium is uh, uh, trying to work and collaborate. In fact, we were looking very closely what you guys are doing and uh, uh, trying to get the some open uh, source examples and one of the examples we already deploy on the RPU. It is uh, what uh, we already presented during internet uh, during the supercomputing conference. Uh, my idea was uh, to show how simply and how easy is to porting the typical Juniper notebook, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, originally uh, dedicated to the GPGPU and uh, can be run the IPU. You see the, the example uh, we described um, uh, on our uh, booth uh, at the supercomputing, but also on the video, which is available on the web page. And when you can see that how Alex is explaining that just adding a couple of the lines to your classical Juniper notebooks, uh, where basically we are just saying, okay, right now, instead of the GPU, please use the IPU, and this is completely all what you need to do. We didn't touch the model, we didn't uh, touch the, any uh, hyperparameters, we didn't touch the, uh, any optimization of the model, but taking out of the shelf how it is, uh, loading uh, to uh, uh, using the IP, using the same uh, uh, approach, we can run these uh, models five times faster what uh, was presented on the A100 uh, GPU. Of course, the model is pretty small and you know it fits just on it. It's not the exascale type of the uh, model from this paper. It was the uh, originally developed by the uh, ECMW uh, MF consortium and uh, we uh, didn't make any modification. But as you can see, our execution out of the shelf without any modification is five times faster than the leading GPU uh, can achieve today. And uh, of course, uh, we already highlighted, uh, highlighted this work we did, uh, together with the uh, Atos team and uh, the, the, the also the, um, using the ACM uh, uh, WF uh, original uh, notebook. So 
Uh, everything is described on the blog. We have the own uh, graphical uh, research uh, web page, uh, including our video, uh, some demonstration, uh, as well the very details explanation what needs to be done. So basically, how you need to put these five lines uh, to the code just to get the uh, five times uh, faster performance versus leading GPU. And of course, uh, if you uh, paraphrase this, what the, the paper in original is saying that, you know, uh, the, taking this approach, uh, we can get the, something like uh, 50 times faster uh, uh, execution. So the, the time to resolution uh, and then the uh, CPU, uh, the model originally was developed. So this is the great idea how the AI can improve the classical simulation. And of course, our uh, hybridization of the HPC and AI story is pretty much the same what you also uh, see and uh, what uh, you are targeting of. And it's not the secret that many of the US centers are looking for the same direction. So we believe that our typical HPC workloads, so we are running today on the anyhow uh, uh, heterogeneous type of the architecture, which is the combination of the CPU or GPU uh, type, will stay uh, where they are. Uh, of course, some workloads which are typical AI and are not connected to the typical HPC simulation, like natural language processing, etc., will run on the dedicated hardware. Hopefully, is going to be the uh, graphical IPO pod 16, 64, 512, or you know the 64,000 of IPOs. But what is the most important to, to the group uh, 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 from the HPC to AI, the group located in Gdańsk, and Alex, myself, it is that this new uh, heterogeneous type of the work of the same what you described. So we are taking the, some classical uh, code and classical solvers, looking how the solvers can be replaced by the AI model and trying, uh, trying to combine them and use the combination of the classical HPC simulation to generate the data. And then, you know, when it's going to the uh, model replacement, it is offloaded to the IPU pod uh, type of infrastructure, calculated the, them, and, the, uh, and then replace it uh, or resend it uh, for the final uh, uh, configuration, visualization, etc. So this is the way how we believe that uh, uh, AI can benefit HPC type of the system. And this is the way how we accelerate the exascale computing in the future. And in my opinion is that I spent the more than 25 years on the classical HPC simulations. So this type of the performance both uh, like uh, five times or 50 times, it, it was uh, not expected uh, by any of us if we are not doing the breakthrough type of the combination of techniques. So next generation of the CPU, uh, or the next uh, the generation of the uh, GPU, if they are using the same part of the uh, solving the problem, if they are bringing the 30% improvement, it's fantastic. But we are talking about the you know, levels of magnitude, uh, uh, not just 30% uh, type of the improvement from one generation to another. And of course, what is our uh, uh, next step? Uh, as you can see, the race is the center of our interest, and we would like to uh, start our uh, deep collaboration with you guys, and you know, see how we can uh, collaborate in our you know common vision uh, of the exascale computing together. Uh, so we are mm, mm, would like to work with you on the some of the. Mm, models we believe are going to fit very well. Uh, in addition to this ECMWF uh, uh, notebook and the model uh, with the hurricane prediction, we are already working very closely with our partner Atos on the, uh, their AI for SIM uh, model. We also um, uh, trying to work uh, with our new partner Hewlett Packard on their approach, which is called the smart SIM. And uh, uh, we uh, have the some very preliminary, very first results with the, some Cosmoflow uh, uh, model when we are just uh, trying this Cosmoflow running on the IPU. And Cosmoflow is probably the, uh, the most popular and the best model of the universe. Uh, and uh, it was uh, initially uh, uh, built, uh, the, the, the simulation uh, was built uh, using the Lagrangian per, uh, perturbation theory, but it is replaced by the CNN model. The model, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, is uh, 
uh, is described uh, below with this uh, seven 3D convolutional layer and three fully connected layers. And when you take this model, and of course we are using the simulation data, they are not uh, 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 real data because the real data uh, set is pretty big, uh, is there more than one uh, uh, terabyte, which is still uh, in download mode in uh, in our case, but we uh, before the supercomputing we run this on the small set of the data uh, and we uh, synthetically uh, you know extend them. So the same like uh, other people you know uh, uh, doing with the AI, and we did the very simply comparison. So the the, the result we achieved it was the two hundred eighty two images uh, per second. This is the best. Uh, published result we we found on the NVIDIA, which was A100, which was uh, 90 images per second. And also our scalability was fantastic. If you can see that uh, this model can grow very, uh, very nicely on the pod 16, pod 64, but also upon 128 and 256, we see the very nice uh, throughput in the scaling uh, capability of our architecture. And we believe that for the biggest model, when, when we are trying to operate on the big data set and the, uh, something what we can redistribute very nicely uh, on our architecture, we, uh, we have the very a compelling story. The another example is the uh, something what we are we took from the uh, uh, flame. This is the uh, large edge simulation uh, and some work. Uh, I believe it has been done also in the uh, race consortium and the the the, the CFRX, uh, uh, proposed new approach for this turbulence convolutional uh, uh, modeling base. And neural network. So we took uh, this uh, this model from the net and uh, we were trying with that with our IPU. Of course, we in this uh, first initial uh, work we didn't um, make uh, so much optimization, uh, but the results are also very impressive. As you can imagine, the model running, the throughput running on on our IPU versus uh, the, the the GPU. Uh, is very impressive, uh, and uh, uh, mm, th this result shows uh, how uh, nicely uh, our, our throughput uh, performs versus uh, NVIDIA. Uh, of course, we uh, we are not taking the compilation time. The compilation time was uh, not taken into consideration, uh, but uh, we were not uh, running a lot of epochs anyhow. Uh, so um, this is what uh, what we achieve on these two. Uh, work uh, very uh, very preliminary, uh, but we believe uh, it uh, should give you the same kind uh, kind of day confident uh, that that is the right approach to to work with us and try our technology and discuss what we can get uh, uh, out of our uh, hardware. And uh, right now, I would like to switch to my colleagues, uh, Alexander, and he's going to give you the, some uh, overview of how easy it is to, to use our popular software, because you know the, the hardware itself is performing nicely, uh, 250 uh, uh, teraflops of the AI performance. But if it's not combined with the software, it's useless. But in our case, this is the, not just software to uh, to plot this uh, uh, fantastic graph, as you can see on the slide right now, but it is uh, also uh, uh, very effective and a nice uh, tool to integrate with the, all the frameworks, you know, from the typical HPC workload. So Alex, the stage is yours. Can you take the- Great, thank you. Um, uh, oh, can sure, I start sharing or you will start sharing? Um, I, I can share, that's no problem at all. Yeah. Okay. So I stopped sharing. Probably the easiest way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Okay. Yeah, nice talk, Pavel. Thank you very much for that already. You're welcome. I think Alex is going to bring the more excitement. <laughs> okay, okay, hopefully you can excellent. see the... Go ahead. Yes, we great. see it. Thanks. Go yeah, ahead. great. So you can see the right one. Okay, great. So um, thanks for the introduction, Pavel. And uh, with all that uh, fantastic hardware we've just seen, we'd better have some good software to go along with it. Otherwise, it's uh, not very easy to use. So that's what I'm going to go into just now. I'll we'll have a look at some of the software, some of the um, the performance on the IPU scene, both in sort of the, the form of, uh, sort of testing and, and performance benchmarking, but also some real world results from research collaborators and, and other people who've got their hands on the IPU nice and early and got some good results. Um, so first of all, we'll have a quick look at our software stack. So um, at the top level, of course, we've got our 
machine learning frameworks. So if you've got a model that's in PyTorch or TensorFlow, for example, we have ports of those. We have a direct port of TensorFlow for the IPU, both for version one, version two. Um, and then we also have a way of working with PyTorch models, which we call PopTorch. It's a popular PyTorch wrapper. And you define your pop, uh, PyTorch model as you would do normally, wrap it in a training or an inference wrapper, and then you treat that object as if it were a normal PyTorch model. Um, and in the background, all of the IPU conversion is effectively done for you. Um, so that's nice and abstracted from the hardware. And, and as we saw in those uh, Jupyter notebooks as well, typically with these, there's uh, in order to actually get the model to target the IPU, there's not an awful lot that these do. Um, of course, things like TensorFlow 1 versus 2, if you're using Keras in TensorFlow 2, you're far more abstracted from whatever hardware you're using than if you're writing training loops in TensorFlow 1. So of course, the lower down the stack you go, the more there'll be slight differences here and there because we are working with different hardware and the more the framework makes you write the code for yourself, of course, the uh, the more differences there might be. Um, on top of these, we'll have a quick look at the uh, the lower level part of the software stack as well, because we, we do have all of that available to the user. And um, just to note a few extra different things that we have support for as well here. So uh, we're working very hard on uh, getting Slurm and Kubernetes support. These are in sort of a beta release at the moment. Um, so for large scale deployment, that'll be really, really handy. Um, also we have our own tools, so things like Pop Vision, so like what we call our, our graph analyzer toolkit. So what we can do with that, you have a, a model or a program or a computational graph running on one or a number of IPUs, and we can see the memory usage across each individual core of each individual IPU, because all of those cores have their own memory, so the memory usage is, is different across each one. We can see all of that. We can see uh, a cycle by cycle execution trace of what each IPU or each core of each IPU is doing at any one time. And we can see all of this so that we can use that then to, to better optimize our programs for the IPU. And then beyond that, more on sort of a data center level, we have things like Grafana and Redfish for uh, hardware management and monitoring and things like that. Okay, so looking more at the software from the user perspective. So as we say, we have our higher level frameworks, TensorFlow 1 and 2 and PyTorch. Um, and then if you have any other framework, for example, Paddle Paddle, you can export your model to Onyx format, and then we can import that as well into our software stack. Um, all of this then, whichever model you have, whichever framework you're using, would go through our popular tool chain. Um, in the case of um, TensorFlow, for example, it's built on top of our library. So we have poplibs, our popular libraries, built on top of our, oops, not my laptop there, built on top of our popular C++ framework. Um, and that sort of forms the back end of TensorFlow. Um, in the case of, say, an Onyx model, we go through what we call PopArt. That's the popular advanced runtime. That allows us to interface with graphs built using the um, <coughs> using the Onyx API. But this also forms the back end of how we do PyTorch models at the moment. So um, in sort of in the background, behind the scenes, sort of abstracted from the user, um, a PyTorch model wrapped in a training or inference wrapper would get converted via this Onyx tool chain um, and then built up into a, a computational graph that Poplar uh, can then deal with. Uh, Poplar itself is effectively, in terms of its function, analogous to CUDA on a, on a GPU. Um, but in terms of how it works, it is a little bit different because, of course, with, with CUDA, you launch kernels. Uh, kernel, typically, you want to have vectorizable code inside that. With Poplar, you have the freedom to tell each individual core and each thread on each individual core to do a completely different operation or the same operation or, or any combination thereof. So it has sort of an extra dimension of parallelism in a sense. So typically, if you want to um, write some complicated computational graph where all of the different threads are doing very different jobs, and then maybe have a big reduction operation to get the one big result back and all this sort of thing, it makes life quite nice and easy really to do that. It is a very powerful, but also relatively simple to use uh, C++ framework. So, the user has the flexibility to go all the way up and down this stack and say you have a, a TensorFlow model, which for the most part, you can stay in a nice high level framework, keep things simple. You could, if you had a really particular use case, particular function that you want to optimize for your edge case, you could just call up a custom popular function there as well. So there's lots of flexibility to uh, mix and match there. And if you really, really want to go super deep into the framework, you can even write some assembly for the IPU as well. So there's lo lots, of, uh, lots of flexibility. Um, what can really help with this as well, actually, is that um, other than the very lowest level uh, areas of the stack where we actually have our silicon IP and all of the uh, all the bits that obviously we want to keep a little bit more under wraps, all of our C++ libraries, 
uh, PopArt, TensorFlow, PyTorch as well. All of these ports and, and PopLibs itself are all open source and available on our GitHub. So if you were writing some very low level code and you want to see how we've written a nice optimized convolution or map model or something like that, that code's available. You can see that and you can even customize PopLibs yourself to do something slightly different and then build your own version of TensorFlow for the IPU against your own version of PopLibs. And there's lots of uh, freedom and flexibility there as well. Okay, so looking at a few um, main kind of markets that we're targeting in terms of the type of applications that go along with these, and we'll see a few examples and performance things uh, to do with this as well. Um, so the main main target markets really are are the ones we have here. So we have uh, things like consumer internet. So obviously lots of things going on in the background while we click around the internet buying things for Christmas and that sort of thing. Um, so of course search engines, smart assistants, customer support, all of these have so many things in the back end, recommenders. Um, any kind of language models for uh, realistic seeming online assistants. I think a lot of them even build in a deliberate delay so that when you ask a question to one of these chatbots, because it takes a little while to respond, it feels more like a human than if it responded immediately. And clever things like that. So there's lots of uh, lots of applications going on behind the scenes there that we're really uh, quite excited about. Um, in the finance space, there's again quite a whole whole range here. Um, it does go from sort of the natural language processing models for uh, various purposes, really, be it customer support or even things like train, uh, trading. There's things like uh, FinBert, where they can train BERT language models on financial uh, corpus and that sort of thing. Um, and then all the way over to insurance as well. We've been, we'll see in a few slides time, we've been working with a particular company looking at um, how they can use computer vision to assist insurance claims after a car crash, things like that. Um, and then also things like the uh, the smaller scale trading or the, the micro transactions and very low latency, high speed transactions there where sometimes there, some of the smaller models can be really useful, but you really want to get that latency down as much as possible because time is quite literally money in that case. Uh, moving over towards healthcare. So again, we've got another, another mix of things here. Again, the natural language processing models tend to come up. Um, quite often models like BERT can be repurposed for uh, protein sequence uh, prediction, things like that. Um, but also there's lots of uh, graph neural networks starting to come in here, not just for representing and recognizing protein sequences, but for lots of other types of uh, approach there. And then we can also see quite a lot of examples of computer vision for things like X-ray classification and things like that. Um, research, so that photo there I believe is CERN. So I've, I've uh, been there for a little while in my past life as a particle physicist. Um, but again, in, in research, of course, there are so many uh, new approaches going on there as well. Things like particle physics and cosmology, where we do have a bit of a bit of a data problem in many ways. That there's so much data to sift through that um, quite often the, the classical algorithms of of deciding whether collision data is interesting enough to keep or not, or uh, just kind of generating realistic looking simulation data, um, either takes so long or is quite long winded. So sometimes you want um, something that's not necessarily more accurate. You just want as accurate but much much faster to execute. And in other cases, you want to model some complex uh, particle dynamics or something like that where it's actually really hard to write a numerical simulation that would be sort of limited order so you're truncating your your uh, series to get to something that you can actually simulate in a useful time frame but is also accurate enough to represent the uh, the physics going on and then on to as well things like weather modeling of course we've seen this in the uh, ecmwf notebooks as well um, looking at how they can use weather modeling things like that and there's some really interesting cases there. I think in the ECMWF paper, they mentioned that um, certain types of models were surprisingly good or bad for this kind of uh, gravity wave drag simulation and things with, with weather forecasting. So I think things like convolutional networks, because they tend to inherently localize certain features, actually really didn't perform that well. So it suggests that if you're trying to uh, predict large scale weather forecasting over a large, uh, large area, actually localizing it doesn't really work, which is quite uh, quite interesting as well. And then finally, towards the, the very end there, we have this uh, AI first kind of area where these are areas much like uh, uh, autonomous driving and things like that, where these things just couldn't really exist without it being very much AI centric and really uh, heavily, heavily focused on that. Okay, so a few uh, quick examples here. So uh, the first one here we have is, um, some work we did with the uh, Oxford Mann Institute of Quantitative Finance. Uh, so this is University of Oxford and this Mann Institute who are sort of semi-attached to the, the university there. 
Um, and for this, they were looking at lots of different uh, financial forecasting models, uh, limit order books, things like this. And, and in that case, they tried a whole uh, variety of different models and tend to find that across the board, the IPU was, was, was faster than the GPUs they were using. But, um, but in many cases, it was up to around 10 times faster. And that was typically a lot of different models. They had some convolutional based models that were uh, dramatically accelerated, but also things like LSTM type models. These uh, we'll see in a little, uh, a little while in a few slides time, I'll, I'll summarize some of the types of models that really do benefit from the IPU and, and some of the reasons why this tends to be. Um, but some of these kind of models were really uh, taking nice advantage of the kind of architecture that we have on the, uh, on the chip. Um, the next one here, this is actually a uh, relatively uh, older benchmark now. This was from back in the uh, early days of the pandemic, which feels like many, many years ago now. I'm sure this is back in early 2020, I think, um, when Microsoft were working on some uh, COVID-19 and pneumonia diagnosis looking at chest x-rays. In this case, we were looking at the uh, the previous generation, so Mark One IPU, as it's known, so the, the one before the, uh, the IPUs that we have now. Um, and in this case, on, on a single chip, compared with the V100 GPU, which of course at the time was the, uh, the, the main one from, uh, from NVIDIA, uh, we found there that the, the training throughput was some 12 times higher. And at the same time, it was using half the, uh, the power in terms, of, in terms of watts. So that was a really nice, uh, nice result as well. Um, and then we come on to, as I sort of briefly hinted to a moment ago, this insurance um, approach where a company called Tractable, they're using or they're developing AI solutions for accident recovery and uh, things like that. And the idea is that you have a bit of a smash, somebody reverses their car into you or something. And uh, by taking photos of, of the car at different angles, they can look at that and get some kind of idea very quickly for um, damage repair estimates, or, or is it worth just scrapping the car or each individual panel? Can you repair that? Do you need to replace that panel? Maybe the Maybe the, uh, the windscreen needs replacing, but the door can be repaired and things like that. So there's uh, some clever approaches being taken there. And they've seen some really nice speed ups on efficient net time models as well, looking around and uh, band of five times speed gain over their GPUs. So just before we go on to any uh, more kind of controlled or official uh, benchmarks and, and some other research uh, stories and, and interesting applications, just to note here a few uh, guiding points, I suppose, of what sort of thing really takes advantage of the IPU. It's not to say that um, other models won't run well, but what are the kind of things that would really take advantage of the IPU and, and be the sort of thing that would be potentially very interesting for research or other applications, but maybe wouldn't suit the GPU particularly well. So maybe that's not something that's been tried before because you know it wouldn't suit the GPU, so it's not an avenue that you explore. Wouldn't it be nice if you could explore that avenue? Um, some of these criteria, of course, will apply to any accelerator. So we'll, we'll go into that as well. So the first thing to note, obviously you want some kind of application, model, whatever it might be, that's got enough compute work to do that it's worth bothering with an accelerator. That could apply to anything really, um, GPU, IPU, or otherwise, um, that realistically, but if by the time you've sent the data to the accelerator and got the result back, you could have done the whole thing on the CPU, then obviously you wouldn't, you wouldn't bother. Um, but some of the, the next points really start to go into a bit more specific. So things like sparse and fine grain approaches. So um, this can be things like sparse matrix operations, um, but there's also lots of different operations that we can chop up in different ways uh, for many different reasons. And we'll go into that on, on the next slide in a bit more detail. Uh, similarly, sequential models. So again, we'll go into this on the, in the, a couple of slides time a little bit more, but typically things that can take advantage of having the really, really fast in processor SRAM type memory. Um, if we can take advantage of that, then typically these models will tend to uh, perform really, really well. Um, anything that's non-trivial, so we can highly parallelize it. Of course, that's something you might apply to a GPU as well. But when we get onto the next point here, when we say hard to vectorize, if you've got something that's very much parallelizable, you could definitely take advantage of lots of uh, parallel processing cores. But all of these different things you want to do at the same time are different operations. At that point, GPUs will start to struggle. Um, you can, of course, launch multiple CUDA kernels. There's a relatively small number that you can launch at once, and there are uh, overheads that come along with this. Whereas on the IPU, each core has no real preference as to whether it's doing part of one massive job, like a vectorized problem, or part of one of many smaller jobs. So there's no performance penalty in having different cores doing different things compared to having them all do the same thing. And then finally, 
of course, we want to make sure that uh, if we put a lot of IPUs in a system and everything looks like it's going to go really, really quickly, we want to make sure that we're not bottlenecked by uh, external I.O. Can we read the data from the disk fast enough or indeed uh, host compute? So say we have some um, computer vision inference workload. The IPUs are processing this very, very quickly. We want to make sure on the CPU we can read our images from disk. We can decode the JPEGs into some kind of uh, raw input tensor fast enough. So obviously, we want to make sure that uh, depending on the application, we have the right kind of host compute and I/O available. This is where having the distributed, uh, the disaggregated approach is really, really nice because you, you're not stuck with the same CPU configuration for a given number of IPUs. You can completely vary that if you have a natural language type approach. You might not really need all that much host compute. If you're doing image-based workloads, you might need a lot more uh, CPU power available. So you can completely vary that depending on what you want to do. So just going into a bit more detail on what we mean by the sparse and fine-grain applications. So some examples here are things like group convolutions. So a ResNet, typical um, sort of the bread and butter image classification model has large convolutions, quite GPU friendly, really. It's obviously been optimized for the GPU purely because that's all that's been available for a long time. Um, when we get towards what we call the next generation models, so models where they're starting to move away from this, trying new features, things like ResNext and EfficientNet, they start to chop up these convolutions along the depth axis. The reason for this is you can start to sever ties that you don't really need between certain areas of parameter space. Typically, you find if you chop these up, you reduce your number of parameters, but you retain a very high level of accuracy. So you can end up being far more efficient with uh, the, the size of your model for the kind of accuracy you can get. The downside there, of course, is once you start chopping convolutions up, you're giving the GPU lots of different operations to do rather than one big one. As a result, then uh, things start to slow down. Whereas, of course, on the IPU, there's no real preference as to whether you're working on or whether this particular core or this thread is working on one part of one of many small convolutions or one part of one big convolution. There's really no penalty either way. Um, so for that, it seems to really suit us quite nicely. Uh, similarly, if you want to start doing some uh, sparse matrix-based work, um, and in this case, particularly um, a lot of language models, we're looking at starting to incorporate sparse pre-training, things like that with things like BERT. Um, that, again, is, is not easily vectorizable. Um, it's something that you'll end up having lots of wasted processor cycles, whereas with the IPU, of course, we can be a lot more flexible in terms of how we distribute that, that kind of workload. And on the right here, we have more to do with sort of finite approaches where things like uh, decision tree based models, things like that are, are still in wider use. Um, and in that case, if you have a, an imbalanced tree, you find that depending on which way down you go of this decision tree, you have far more branches this way than that way and so on. Then uh, again, that's quite hard to vectorize. You'd end up wasting cycles on the GPU. Uh, one thing to note on top of this as well is that um, it sort of ties in a little bit with the whole batch size argument as well that uh, typically on a GPU, you have uh, single instruction, multiple data type processing. You, you can do the same thing on lots of bits of data. That's what it's designed for. Obviously, things like projecting shadows in a 3D rendered scene in a game is exactly what the GPU is built for. And that is the same math for every pixel, effectively. Once you start doing different things, it's a bit more tricky. Um, that combined with the off-chip memory on a GPU um, is why typically we want to go to a very large batch size on a GPU when training a model because you can parallelize over the batch. Um, so if your batch is 512, obviously you can do that many operations at once if you've got enough uh, GPU cores available. Whereas if your batch size is one, then obviously your performance will suffer. Um, but at the same time with batch size one, you're, you're grabbing from off-chip memory small amounts of data very often, which incurs a lot of latency. Um, on the IPU, of course, we can parallelize over the operations in our model. So batch size one isn't really a problem. And at the same time, our memory latency, because it's on chip, is single cycle. Can't really get any lower memory latency. So um, as a result, we can typically perform very, very well, even at really, really low batch sizes, which would be very handy depending on the model as well. A few examples here on the sequential type models, we say. Um, so in this case, it's situations where we can really utilize that in-processor in memory very heavily. Uh, things like Markov chain Monte Carlo, any kind of sampling, is that again, we're really hitting the memory hard there. We also pick up an extra bit of a benefit because we have a random number generation built into the hardware. So that also helps a little bit with things like sampling. 
Uh, recurrent neural networks, again, we're going back and back on, on the same bits of data in the memory over and over. So again, we can really uh, attack that in processing memory very, very quickly. So that 47 and a half terabytes per second per IPU chip bandwidth really starts to become uh, very useful. So things like LSTM type layers will particularly benefit from the IPU memory. And then finally, things like uh, Bayesian computation, anything where we're introducing some kind of random noise elements to, to things as well. Again, with the, uh, the memory and uh, the random number generation built into the hardware, this combination gives us a really nice performance edge there as well. Okay, so that's sort of a few examples on what sort of things we see in the wild that we would typically expect uh, to perform well on the IPU in particular. And now we'll have a look at some of the uh, more kind of uh, more robust and reproducible performance benchmarks, all of which, the, the, or the code for all of which, can be found on our GitHub uh, repository as well. Um, so I won't go into too many benchmarks. I'm sure we'll all get a bit of benchmark fatigue otherwise. So I'll, I'll keep this relatively brief. Um, but first of all, we'll have a look at some computer vision models and we'll just sort of uh, go along with a little story there. So first of all, uh, ResNet, as we say, the, uh, the, the typical classification algorithm for things like ImageNet data sets and, and the challenges that went along with that a few years back. Um, can you recognize a cat from a car, from a dog, from whatever else are in the categories? Um, in this case, it is a very much GPU optimized model. If you were to walk down the street and trip over a model, odds are it's already been optimized for the GPU because that's the typical hardware we've had available. But ResNet really is the sort of the epitome of that in the sense that it's big convolutions, big GPU friendly operations. And despite that, we still find ourselves keeping up very nicely um, on a pod 16 compared with a a100 DGX box, so eight A100 GPUs in that. Um, and when we take into account the uh, the cost of each platform, the um, performance per unit of currency tips quite nicely in the favor of the IPUs. Um, and at the same time, we'd, we'd anticipate we'd be using a little bit less uh, power consumption there as well, based on sort of nominal figures. Um, when we go towards newer models, of course, so ResNet, obviously, um, when we say ResNet is quite an old model, what we mean is it's more than about a year old, but um, typically it, ha it has been out for a little while now in terms of uh, the life cycle of, of uh, popular neural networks. Um, and there are some newer versions out there which are sort of competing. So one big example of which is, of course, EfficientNet. And at this point, we, uh, much like ResNex, we chop the convolutions up along the depth axis. In the case of EfficientNet, we actually chop it as much as we possibly can so into uh, depths of one. Um, and in that case, then obviously the GPU has got a lot more different uh, sort of small operations to do. And depending on the framework, it will try and launch multiple kernels and it will try and have to serialize certain operations and do a bit of a hybrid approach. And there's obviously some compromises going on there. On the IPU, we just chop the convolution up, distribute those operations across the cores and there's no real problem. So then suddenly the raw performance tips very much in favor of the IPU. And even more so, again, when we start taking into account the, the price of these solutions as well. Um, so all the pricing information is on here as well, just for, for comparison. But in this case, we're looking at uh, comparing with a, a DGX A100 box that costs roughly twice as much as the IPU pod 16. So moving on to uh, natural language processing type model. So typically BERT is the, uh, the most popular, most famous one of these uh, developed by Google about three years ago and um, actually was designed to be more efficient on GPUs compared with the models for natural language processing that came before it. So again, it's um, another GPU friendly model. Um, we're very much looking forward to uh, the point where we have lots of nice IPU optimized, IPU design models that we can see the real performance of the, uh, of the IPU. Uh, at the moment, we're content with doing quite well on GPU optimized models. So looking at this, obviously, things like BERT, you don't just train and deploy, you have different phases of this. So uh, we have the phase one pre-training example here. So typically we're seeing uh, about double the throughput compared with the leading GPUs. Moving on then to fine tuning. So pre-training is, is uh, self-supervised. Um, so you're not having a, a, a labeled data set. You're taking something like Wikipedia data set, which is uh, unlabeled and realistically, it's like, too big to label really, it's enormous. Um, Training uh, self-supervised fashion on that. This can take sort of hours to days. It's typically a long process. Um, and then we do the fine tuning on a smaller data set that's typically 
more appropriate or more tuned to the exact situation you want to uh, look into. So you might pre-train on Wikipedia and then fine tune on something that's more domain specific, that's what you're interested in. That then can be a smaller data set that you can more realistically uh, label for fine tuning. That then is a, a typically a quicker process, but again, we're seeing um, almost double the throughput compared with the GPUs uh, for that as well. And then finally looking again at uh, Bert Large inference. Um, and in that case, again, we're seeing very close to double the inference throughput of the GPU as well. Um, I won't go into all the details of every, every individual step, but just looking at the pre-training briefly. Um, again, here comparing with, uh, in this case, we're looking at a pod 64, so 64 IPUs, and we're comparing that with uh, two DGX A100 boxes, so uh, 16 A100 GPUs. Um, and this case here, we see across the different frameworks, uh, be it TensorFlow or PyTorch, obviously we have the direct comparisons with the uh, with the GPUs, uh, and these throughput numbers are quite, you know, obviously quite a lot higher here than uh, than on the DGX A100 boxes um, for a sort of a similar price point. But at the same time, we also have uh, PopArt at the top there. This is our uh, Onyx interface framework, so we can also build models directly in PopArt, or we can import existing Onyx based models. Uh, typically, Onyx you would use for inference, but actually we can also do training with an Onyx model via PopArt by adding on the optimizer and the loss functions and doing all the, the backward pass in that. Um, PopArt is a little bit lower level. It's not quite C++ framework level, but it, it is a little bit lower level than TensorFlow and PyTorch. So um, it does require a bit more coding effort comparatively, but typically that is the, the fastest framework in many ways because you just get that that benefit of being a little bit lower level, you can reduce some of the overheads of the of the Python frameworks. So um, that tends to be the target for our PyTorch and TensorFlow frameworks to, to try and catch up with in terms of performance. But in all cases, we see a nice uh, performance boost over the GPUs. One thing I should mention as well with all of these performance figures is that, of course, when we come out with a new version of the hardware, so going from first generation IPU to the second generation, we saw a very nice uh, speed boost comparatively on similar models. But one thing we also see is when we go from one SDK version to another, so in the software releases, we also see some really nice performance gains there. Particularly at the bottom there, ResNet 50, we can see that over the last 12 months, we've more than doubled the throughput purely from uh, software improvements, not, not hardware. So uh, the idea is that whatever the hardware is today, the actual performance will continue to get better and better purely through software updates. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, so uh, natural language processing and computer vision, uh, we're seeing some really nice uh, performance increases there, typically on models that have already been built for the GPU. So even then we're seeing some really nice speed ups. Um, looking at kind of innovative models, new approaches, we've seen some uh, Mark of Chain Monte Carlo based uh, approaches for uh, finance. I think it's a company called Karma uh, Capital who did a lot of uh, finance modeling over in the US. And their off the shelf Mark of Chain Monte Carlo model in TensorFlow was running some 16 times faster. So that was really taking advantage of the IPU memory and uh, going very much faster. And then for things like inference as well, uh, typically we're seeing throughput gains across the board with inference, but at the same time, because we can perform very well at low, at low batch size, we often see a very low latency as well, which depending on the application um, for inference can be uh, vitally important as well. So on our, on our developer website, on our uh, resources page here, we have what we call our model garden. So we have lots of different examples on GitHub and we can uh, refine which example is most appropriate to, uh, to use us to have a look at, either to directly use or to use as a bit of inspiration. Um, so we can filter by that, or we can just go to our GitHub examples repository and we can see all of our examples there as well. So we've got lots of different examples in different frameworks uh, for training, inference, and, uh, and things like that. So lots of resources to have a look at. And we also have some simpler examples. So tutorials, getting started, kind of simple models as well. So there's lots of different examples, of different, different levels, different areas of the software stack um, and different levels of complexity as well. Okay. Um, so we'll go into a few uh, interesting research uh, applications and stories in a moment. First of all, I want to briefly hint as well that we do have an academic program where we can um, offer, uh, as well as hardware, also sort of collaboration and working with our research team. So we have our own research team in-house who are doing a lot of 
interesting work on uh, on various things and are more than happy very much interested with uh, collaborating with uh, external organizations as well and we'll go into a few of these stories in a moment uh, but just to say that we are always interested in uh, in this sort of thing as well uh, so first of all we've got a, a story here from uh, our research team along with university of california at berkeley they were looking at um, parallel training networks with local updates so rather than one big global backward pass doing different updates at different layers um, and they saw some really nice uh, performance update uh, improvements there and really it boiled down to very different type of architecture allowing them to do that efficiently in a way that wouldn't really have been something that they would necessarily be able to investigate so well on uh, on existing hardware uh, another nice story another another covid based one of course there's uh, unsurprisingly there's quite a lot of uh, covid research going on uh, this again was um, a little while ago it was on the first generation ipus and it was early in the pandemic so at that point they were looking at uh, epidemiology models to look at the spread of covid19 of course at this point now it's already spread quite a lot but um, at the time of course it was that thing about how will this spread that would be really interesting to find out um, in that case compared with the Again, the V100 GPUs, which were the, the top GPUs at the time, they found that they had a, a seven and a half times improvement in, uh, in performance there compared with the, the GPUs. Uh, I should note, by the way, all of these papers and resources and things are available on our website as well, so that the link's down there at the bottom, um, and you can find all these papers on there. So another interesting story here, going again in a very different direction, onto cosmology. So we work with some researchers at the University of Paris and they were looking at sort of two different sides of of uh, cosmology applications first of all they were looking at uh, Bayesian neural networks for estimating the shape parameters of galaxies but also generative models because they had a, an issue of basically how do we generate realistic looking galaxy images for, for study and for simulation um, in in the sense that it's one of these things that the sort of numerical simulation can be very slow so um, in this case, they're looking at generative networks for that. And again, they found some really nice speed ups of the GPUs in both the uh, shape estimation and also the uh, image production um, models as well. Uh, another nice story here, uh, my old uh, research group at the University of Bristol and CERN, um, they were looking at uh, IPUs, not just for one particular use case, but actually for a whole variety of use cases at CERN. So, uh, they're all working on the LHCB experiments, so one of the one of the four main experiments on the, the Large Hadron Collider, and and rather than saying let's have a look at it for this particular type of simulation, they were looking at lots of different aspects in that end-to-end -end particle physics simulation and data analysis and everything else uh, kind of process. So first of all, there's the um, simulating what you want to look for itself. So they were looking at using GANs to uh, simulate realistic looking. Uh, collision data and interaction with materials as the particles go through the detector. They're also looking at um, what we call triggering. So you collide protons, you have lots of data coming from each collision. Not every collision produces something interesting enough to warrant keeping. Typically, you can't store everything to disk. And actually, most of it is just low energy noise anyway. Um, but when you start doing things like triggering, you say, is this interesting or, uh, enough to keep or not? But if you say yes, typically because you have a limited buffer, you can't acquire the next one or two collisions. So if you keep this one, you're hoping that it's more interesting than what you expect the next one to be. So you've got to be a bit careful in terms of if your threshold's too low, you might end up keeping too much low energy noise and not getting enough interesting stuff. So they're looking at very quick, sort of low latency um, decision making of whether this thing looks interesting or not, whether they can reconstruct some interesting particle or, or not if it's not there. Uh, in the time frame now after that they're also looking at um other kind of detector uh, simulation using kalman filters and also the data analysis so afterwards have we found some interest in the physics or not <clears throat> does this um data line up well with what we'd expect this thing to look like or not and so on so looking at uh, crystal ball fits and things like that so lots of different applications in the, in the whole tool chain um where ipus can be beneficial that was really interesting as well finally we have a few uh, just to, to wrap up the uh, the collaborations here we have a few other nice uh, sort of stories some of which are um neural network based so 
low dimensional, uh, low dimensional random bases, the top right there, and also looking at small batch training. That's our own research team looking at there at um, how we can utilize small batch sizes to take, you know, take advantage of that to uh, train models more efficiently. Quite often, large batch sizes don't necessarily give you a, the best kind of result. Um, the top left is actually not a, a neural network at all. It's more classical computer vision. So uh, the Imperial College researchers were looking at effectively the problem of a robot with a camera on its head goes into a room and from the perspective it can see, it can see you know, a table here and then some other objects around. How can it use that perspective to work out where it is in the room? So um, looking from your perspective, working out your location. Um, and then finally at the bottom right, uh, some more HPC focused work at the University of Bristol. They were looking at um, kind of stencil based algorithms and other kind of uh, HPC type problems using IPUs. And they've um, very nicely published their code on, on GitHub as well. They've made a nice uh, IPU cookbook with lots of low level uh, C++ Poplar code and things in there as well that they're, they're encouraging other researchers to uh, to use and uh, and develop and and add things onto that as well. So that's great. Okay, so finally, just to wrap up, we have um, a few different uh, publications here to have a look at. Again, all of these papers are on our website. Um, our own research team are looking at um, things like BERT in particular. How can we transform these kind of models um, into kind of more efficient versions or more useful versions? So things like PAC BERT. Typically with uh, things like BERT, you have your, your language model that expects some sequence as input, so a sequence of sentences or words, for example. Um, and typically you have in your data set, if your model's expecting a sequence length of 384 tokens, most of your sequences in the data set you'll find are actually less than half of that. So if you arrange the data set correctly and uh, prepare the model appropriately, you can pack these sequences together and typically get about double the throughput. So looking at uh, some great work with that. Uh, group BERT, so looking at adding group convolutions. So again, this is where we chop convolutions up along the depth axis. Um, and on the IP, that can give you a really nice performance advantage of, uh, in terms of accurately training the model, not having so many parameters, getting a nice uh, nice performance there. And then finally, also looking at um, sparse pre-training of BERT. So uh, another, another area of uh, interest that the IP could be really helpful for. We, of course, do have lots of other um, publications available. Um, some of these from external, so on the left there, it's kind of slightly blurry, I'm afraid, but um, that's the, uh, the HPC work from the University of Bristol. Um, so their, uh, their papers on archive and also papers with code. Um, and some of these other, other papers here are from our, our own research team, along with uh, other universities and Google Research and our other collaborators. So uh, it's great to, uh, great to see some nice research being done directly on the IPUs. Um, so to wrap this part up a little bit, so um, as we say, we do have our academic program. Uh, typically in this case, it, it's um, aligned somewhat with our research team's main uh, areas of interest and priorities. So if anybody is looking at some of these research priority areas, that's something we'd be more than happy to uh, collaborate on as we've done so with uh, many of the universities before. Um, and in, in general, we're obviously more than happy to work with, uh, with lots of other application areas as well. Otherwise, all that remains to say is thank you very much for uh, for listening. Thank all right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Pavel, you want to have some concluding words, maybe? Uh, from my side, I would like just to repeat what I already said, uh, that we are very interested in uh, what you are guys uh, doing at the RACE Consortium. So if you see that any area or interest of collaboration, we're more than open uh, to speak with you. Uh, just send us email and we will set up the um, call and we will go to the details. We are going exactly um, in the same direction like you uh, you are planning to do, how we can uh, couple the um, AI to HPC workload just to solve this uh, most fundamental exascale type of the problems. All right. Yeah, then I also would like to thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, I have just one administration question before we start the real Q&A. Um, there were some confidential, um, graph code confidential, I think, on Alexander's and your slide, Pavel. Um, just that you know that it will be on YouTube, right, on a channel. 
Um, just make sure you don't expose things which are maybe confidential. And as I said, we have a post processing coming, so you can maybe mm. still, you know, black out some slides if you think, you know, that's yeah. that's useful or need to be. No, I think actually that's most likely a, a PowerPoint template gone slightly ah, okay. rogue. I think in that case, that I don't think anything we've shown here is uh, confidential to my. Yeah, my absolutely. Yeah, everything is public, or even. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we try to be cautious, and you know. Uh, mm, Sometimes the confidential may appear without a, a, a intention. Okay, yeah, good to know. Otherwise, as I said, there will be a post processing. There's a guy from us in the race project. Um, I would open the floor for questions from the audience. I have a couple of questions, but firstly, if there's someone from the audience, um, please speak now. I don't see questions in the chat right now, if I'm not mistaken. But if anybody here in the call has some question, please go ahead. I can start uh, a couple of mm -hmm. questions from my side. Please, Ari. Um, the I was really impressed with the results, especially for the for the LDS uh, trainings that you have done with the Surfax and like five times increased performance over A one hundred is amazing. Um, so. Did you compare the the power required for those IPUs compared to A100s on that, for instance, scale? So are they in similar level, the power requirements? Uh, Ray, just to, to answer your question very quickly, we were not. In fact, you know, we were using the instances for the AWS. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, um, scenario and setup. Uh, first of all, the secondly, uh, when we are just comparing uh, single uh, um, AR 100 versus uh, single IPU, uh, it's different combination because in our case, uh, it, it, just to be fair, we can do it the platform to platform comparison because we are not, uh, we have the cards as you have seen. So it's very hard to, uh, you know, exclude this for the whole thermal envelope. But if it's the DGX to the uh, to uh, uh, to our um, the pot uh, solution, so I mean the pot uh, sixty four to DGX is to the pot sixty four. Yes, we are planning to do this also. The, this kind of the comparison we in have. In fact, we have the uh, uh, expert of Adam Chivaniak who was on the call, but he left for the another. Who is the expert in the thermal envelope uh, measurements? So we will do this. As I said, it is very preliminary work. So give our, our, our time, and we are more than happy to work also with you if you are interested in this subject. Oh, yeah, thank you for this answer. And maybe a second question for Alexander. You talked about the software stack and as a user, I have always been struggling with that. So how often are you updating these software stacks or how often are you planning to update these softwares? For instance, if the new version comes and we really want to benefit from that, is it like with a time period or we can just uh, immediately updated is it so easy with those systems um so typically it's a quarterly release so um uh, i'm trying to think when our next one's expected i think relatively soon we're expecting another one but typically we go on on a quarterly uh, development cycle um depending on of course if there are some uh, uh bigger uh improvements or, or anything else that can vary slightly and of course at different times of year it can be more or less convenient but but on, on the whole it's typically four releases per per year uh, for instance, if we want an urgent uh, update, would that uh, be possible, or would you always wait for this quarterly updates? Um, yeah, so it's on in that sense, it's more on a case by case basis. But yeah, okay. if there is something that would really is absolutely blocking what you want to do, or would be really beneficial or something, then that's something we can always discuss. And um, it's it's mainly about making our, our internal teams aware rather than anything else. But uh, typically, that's something we can we can always look into. Nice. And maybe last question, I think it's a general question about the silicon shortage. What are your opinions on that? How is this affects your uh, it does. work life? <laughs> it does. You know, it's the global problem. It, it uh, also impacted us in various cases, not only our own silicon, but uh, as you can imagine, uh, is the combination of other components, so uh, including switches or the 
host server with uh, 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 which needs to be sitting on the top of it. So yes, we we, we see this problem. Uh, fortunately, uh, we don't have a big shortage of building our platforms, uh, but uh, yeah, we see this uh, absolutely. A good uh, good point is that we have the great uh, relationship with uh, our. Silicon manufacturer, which is the TCMC, uh, as you probably are aware, uh, Grafco uh, has been selected together with Apple to be the um, testing uh, um, silicon um, vendor. This is public information for the um, three nanometers process technology. So um, our silicon team has a great relationship with the TCMC. But yeah, it is the global problem. And yeah, we are not excluded from this. Uh, thank you for these answers and the presentation. That's it from my side. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Ari. I can also say last week at the supercomputing, this was, of course, always a discussion, right? This this global shortage in this area. So let's hope we, we will soon solve that. Um, another question maybe from someone else on the call. Um, I have a question. Um, so, ahead, uh, uh, so this is regarding the accuracy, um, let's say with uh, increase in the uh, number of cores or um, as you uh, have uh, more number of IPUs in your, in your models. Um, so uh, I just wanted to have uh, your view on that. Like it, it was very impressive to see the, the parallel performance and the efficiency that you, that you are able to achieve. So do you also have any uh, study with respect to how this, for example, bird performs with this, uh, with uh, this massive paralyze, parallelization in terms of the accuracy. Um, could you give uh, some comments on that? Because we had such issues in, ter in terms of um, how the models perform uh, as we have too many, let's say, GPUs or nodes uh, on our, uh, in our work. Alex? Um, so in that case, actually, I'm not 100% sure whether we do have any um, uh, accuracy comparisons directly to uh, to share in that in that sense of that. So, um, of course, as you say, typically, as, as you scale uh, data parallel across more and more IPUs, you, effectively, your batch size is increasing. So you've got to be a bit a bit careful with that. But um, yeah, it depends. So on, on certain models, depending on uh, what our batch size effectively is, um, in a lot of cases, we can we can do what we call a gradient accumulation, where we do a number of forward passes per backward pass. So mm -hmm. as you scale out more and more IPUs data parallel, you can re reduce that factor so that your effective batch size remains fairly constant. So that, that also gives a bit of a, a buffer there. Um, but because we typically train on a fairly low batch size to start with, because we, we can on the IPU, um, right. that does give us opportunity to use a lot of IPUs without the, without the batch size. Yeah. You're not having to start at a batch size of 128 per chip and then finding that it's enormous. Um, that right. does give us a bit of a, a nice uh, benefit there as well. Um, but no, I'm not sure that we have um, a direct uh, accuracy comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, but yeah, that maybe something uh, would be nice to work on, uh, on collaborate on perhaps at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, and anyway, thank you for the nice, for the nice talk. It was very interesting. <laughs> sure there. Okay, yeah, thank you for the question, Rakesh. I could also say with two of my PhD students looking into these large bit size problems with varying learning rate and, and things like that. So they're very active in this and would be, you know, intri I think very nice to, to use your system. They also experiment with D-wave quantum annealers, so they're always, you know, aware of new technology. We do it, let's say, in one of the race use cases in the areas of remote sensing. So that is more a kind of, um, you know, hyperspectral images. It's a bit more like the COVID, so not indirectly, you know, not directly or indirectly connected to a numerical, you know, method uh, application or known physical law application, but still image recognition. But um, when you when you think about the steps, how you do it, how would a PhD start? Do they have a for you, basically, they need an SSH key. It's just like a normal system access. Would there be a demo system? Um, is it, let's say, with multi-users kind of, you use like Slurm and can integrate with this. Could you say a little bit what would be the kind of practical steps to start the collaboration? Is there some you know, NDA we have to sign? 
things like that to 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 get the first baby steps for our PhDs to work on these systems. So is there two aspects we need to take uh, uh, to discuss? The first one is the you know the scientific groups uh, working directly with uh, me and Alex uh, when we would like to uh, to see how the um, IPU system is going to fit to your uh, research in the sense that is there some interesting model which can be uh, in the future benefiting uh, the uh, the real real research in the case. The second one uh, is the um, typical academic program when you uh, have to apply to this program when we are uh, discuss and reviewing uh, the your uh, type of the workload because uh, as Alex said uh, not every workload is you know suitable for our system and then you we are uh, going to give you the something like a two weeks uh, free. Uh, time of use uh, our uh, graph cloud as we uh, call it where you will get the, some kind of the training how to apply your work and also how is the specific to, to run the job uh, but uh, this is a, this is a very uh, very well organized process we have the onboarding when our one of our FIE engineer is uh, guiding you how to use our machine but uh, in the race consortium uh, projects uh, i would say we are more looking for the collaboration with the scientific group when you are just trying to exactly achieve what uh, uh, what we are planning to do so just to find uh, some kind of the ipi or build uh, some ipi or some model which can replace the typical simulation and can benefit you know big exascase computing so this is the two area for the students i would say and more for the research group which is more um, alex myself uh, type of the collaboration we have the also group of the um, customer engineering uh, team in Gdansk when uh, when he's going to help you optimize your models your uh, application to to be uh, uh, to be ready for the um, IPO. It, it's not the secret that, of course, we are looking for the more extra scale uh, type of the project where a uh, potentially customer can buy our system, not just only test, but also the buy. So something what is uh, uh, in perspective uh, um, uh, connected to the big projects, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sure. I understand the return of investment, right? Sorry, Alex. No, 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 sorry. Um, no, I was going to say, yeah, just, just to clarify a little bit as well, the, um, in terms of access, yeah, so if you if you did have access through the academic program or, or Graph Cloud, be it a free trial, or you can also have paid access like a cloud provider, um, typically with that, as you say, that would be SSH access. So uh, that, 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 all that sort of thing tends to work nicely. Uh, so you can SSH in via terminal, VS Code, whatever you want. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks as well uh, should, should work perfectly nicely as well there. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's good to know because the uh, user feel is, of course, also uh, very important in that sense. And having some experience working with D-Wave quant no need is <laughs> a little bit different than the usual HPC yeah. systems, um, you know. But anyway, I think that's what we want to do with, you know, kind of disruptive technology like you provided. Um, I think Gael is here also. And uh, from one respect, you said there's <laughs> Aptos, the collaboration. And I think in the future, we maybe make another seminar, if you want, uh, together with Atos, where, you know, Atos would also present their use case because they work in this intertwined simulation. Uh, Gail, you want to maybe talk something about it a bit? Uh, yeah, I just can say a few words because we, we've we done, a, and it's not an end, but uh, we work together with GraphCore on several use cases. Um, a publication on their website uh, is describing the, the work on, on various... Uh, models for weather and climate modeling and on combustion use case, the, the RAISE one. Um, and we, we're very glad to, to work with, uh, with GraphCore on that aspect. Uh, and I just have one question because uh, it's a recurrent question for, for me. The, the team, uh, the ai the sim team, the Atos one, uh, is working uh, more and more with PyTorch and, and PyTorch Geometric. Uh, will you support in the near future uh, those uh, features in uh, in uh, Poplar? Well, you you ask it this question in various times. I think you want the, our commitment recorded. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a half a joke. Uh, he's, but, uh, he's a smart guy. Careful, careful. <laughs> <laughs> 
so uh, yes we're working on this uh, uh, alex do you have any deadline or which uh, revision is no you? no I'm, I'm, i was joking just to be sure th that you identify that's an important subject but um, we, we yeah. are not the only one uh, working with a uh, pytorch lightning and pytorch geometric on on, on graph uh, graph net Alex, you have the, the date or you have the, any commitment from this? No, I don't think we have a date as such for, for geometric. Certainly, we, we, we do have a lot of people working on, on that and many aspects within that. Um, I can say, as it's nicely uh, segued in, that PyTorch Lightning, we do have nice support for there. So, um, and that's quite nice that it was the support was built by PyTorch Lightning as well. So we didn't actually do that. They, they did it for, for themselves, which was really nice. Okay, thanks. All right, yeah, I think we should go from here and maybe have another one in six months, if you both agree. I mean, maybe we can have a little bit more details then on the Atos use case. I mean, this was now a seminar we agreed on the supercomputing conference last week. It would be quite nice to have it, you know, relatively ad hoc and, and to have some first ideas. And we can come back maybe if you both agree, let's say from Atos and from Graphco to give an update maybe in, in half a year what the use cases are, and maybe have another one that we can maybe have from another race use case at that time. I think absolutely. for today, I have to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Ben. Absolutely, uh, Maurice, once again, thanks very much. And uh, if uh, any question or the interest for collaboration uh, with us uh, uh, will appear, please uh, contact me and we will be more than, than happy to work with you guys because it's a very uh, similar job what we are doing. So thanks from the GraphCo side very much. You're welcome. Okay, so I think I don't want to make it longer very much just for basically closing this year properly. Um, I think you're still aware that you can send emails everyone to, to GraphCore and that they have actually a large problem for academic uh, program for academic groups and so on. So just for closing here, if you want to know more about race, etc., all the use cases that in one way or another may be, take use of GraphCore that we had heard from the Atos use case, for instance, please go to our webpage, just one pointer here. Today we had heard about GraphCore, just to let you know that we of course also are interested in other hardware infrastructures, not only those which are now in the top 500 like Juvils or the Barcelona systems, we experiment also with other facilities like the quantum computing at Ulich, for instance, but GraphCore would be just another one. So, and stay tuned what updates come for our unique AI framework in the project. Basically, I also would encourage you to look at the YouTube channel. We're still lagging a little bit behind the videos to upload them, but we, we're coming you know, across that very shortly, where you will find every month the topic that we have created in you know, CUU Race in terms of a seminar. And as we said, also, we will put this seminar here today in this YouTube channel. So please have a look in YouTube and if possible, maybe also give it a like or subscribe to it. Um, and in a way, we want to close the year a little bit with another seminar. It will be a short seminar on so-called UNETs. Without taking too much of the content already, you see that some of the use cases here are actually using units in practice. And this will be more a seminar on how actually UNETs work. They have a so-called contracting path, which you see here a little bit, and then an expensive path. So in this sense, um, you see this interesting U forming, and we will talk about, of course, in the seminar in December. So please um, be aware that we will do some selected application examples alongside with it, and then basically have another seminar probably around the 15th to 20th of December, shortly before Christmas. That's all from the seminar today. Thank you very much for joining, and see you on YouTube soon.